We're so honored to have us today with us today. Uh, uh, four people I want to introduce to you, and three will join me on stage now, one will speak later. So first of all, I, I want to salute one of the great uh, public servants uh, of our generation who's literally given his lifetime to the service on behalf of our nation and our allies, U.S. National Security Advisor General McMaster. Uh, and then uh, join me shortly on stage, not just yet, President Vajonas, pres uh, the, the President of Latvia, President Kaljulaid, uh, the President of Estonia, and then uh, Foreign Minister Linkovicius uh, of Lithuania. Um, these are three presidents, now think about this for a second, these are three presidents of countries whose independence was lost for the bulk of the 20th century, uh, presidents of countries whose independence was re-won, restored. I'm very happy that I spent time in all uh, three of those countries in 1991, 92. Um, uh, but if there are any three countries in the world that tell the lesson of um, history not being preordained, but being shaped by the most determined of actors. It is these three countries, and I think we're gathered here uh, to show once again that we can be the most determined of actors, and that this rewon and this retaken independence will be permanent in nature. Um, history's outcomes are not inevitable, and they are shaped by this level of determination in the Atlantic Council uh, will always be there with you, and as will the United States. And I think we were all uh, delighted by President Trump's White House statement today. Quote, from the very beginning of your country's independence, the United States never, and this is like never, uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't give it the right intonation. Uh, <laughs> and I think you know that better than anybody, never ceased to recognize the sovereignty of the three Baltic republics, even though throughout the years, there's been a lot of conflict, a lot of problems, a lot of difficulty, and we never let you down, and we won't let you down, unquote, President Trump. <laughs> so I can hardly imagine a better way to represent and celebrate the closeness of the U.S.-Baltic partnership than to have all four of you with us here this evening. Um, it is of great significance, actually, to have two of the presidents and then one of the ministers with us this evening. From what I've heard, it's been a busy and exciting summit thus far uh, with the official declaration on U.S.-Baltic partnership, the conversation of the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, and now uh, this conversation. So with that, it's my true honor now to welcome to the stage uh, the Estonian and Latvian presidents and the Lithuanian foreign minister, if you'll please join me. Do you know where people are sitting? Do you know what people are saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to let you all know, uh, Damon's fine uh, talking, and he, he, he seems to have recovered quite a bit. We're correcting a, a blood sugar level, and, uh, and, and we don't think that he'll require any uh, emergency treatment um, that would require him to leave here. So uh, we're relieved by that. Um, so I think I'd like to start with the Latvian president and the Estonian president. If you can, can assess for us uh, what you felt was important today, uh, what you felt was achieved today, and maybe a little bit of what yet has to be achieved in terms of uh, our relationship with the Baltics. But first of all, a little bit of an assessment. We've seen the press reports. Some people haven't seen all of them. But I'd love to have a little bit of your feeling of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the significance of the summit. OK. Good, good evening, everybody. Of course, to, today was a very interesting day for all three Baltic presidents. Uh, Today, it's uh, a really very, very important and historic day for us. Why? Uh, I think it's, we are very honored uh, to celebrate uh, our long 
standing uh, friendship uh, and uh, partnership together with our friends here in the US and uh, uh, all countries, Baltic countries and the US are not only strategic partners, but we are friends. I think it means uh, a lot. Today, at the White House, we discussed many, many uh, issues, but first of all, we discussed how and what uh, we together have achieved. Of course, it is already history, but uh, the most important part was what we can do more in the future. And of course, security issues for our region is very, very important and uh, do uh, many reasons. Main reason is our unpredictable neighbor, Russia. And we still have uh, a lot of, lot of rumors about, about uh, Russia, how they can react in different situations. And of course, uh, Damon already mentioned it, uh, this uh, exercise uh, last, last year, uh, Zapad 2017, it's, it was a really huge exercise. Uh, they use a little bit different maybe scenario comparing with uh, previous exercise uh, because it was, this exercise was very wide uh, it started from uh, White Sea and down to Black Sea. It means that all, all border of the, the eastern border of NATO, Ukraine, and uh, also Belarus was involved in this exercise. It means that they really make a uh, huge exercise. Number of uh, participants it's it's not so easy to say ho how much, but uh, it's from 50 to 100,000 uh, soldiers during all all period. It's huge amount comparing with the uh, number of our soldiers in our national armies. But uh, it is it is the reason why it's so important, friends friends within NATO, for example, because the uh, presence of NATO forces in our region uh, are, uh, is very crucial for us. Very crucial for us and very important for us. And of course, uh, different countries are presented and uh, the largest part of NATO countries are are presented in our our region uh, under different uh, di different leading countries like UK, Canada, Germany, or US in in Poland. But uh, anyway, anyway, uh, despite uh, these locations uh, for for all three Baltic countries, the US forces presence in our region, I, in this case I mean the Baltic states, uh, is one of the key and most important factor for us. Uh, and during our meeting we also discussed this issue and uh, we hope that uh, U.S. forces presence in, in a region will continue. Uh, it will be long long standing uh, pres presence okay we can find different words how we can call it but uh, but anyway i think for us for all three baltic countries the us presence are is very very important uh, maybe i will be so just one quick follow up question yes you said uh, you want the forces long-standing in your country. You said different words we could call that. Would you rather it be called permanent presence rather than rotating, per persistently rotating? It was the reason why I said that. Uh, <laughs> because each country tried to, yeah. to interpret uh, this uh, 
presence in different worlds. Right. And of course, uh, it's a very politically sensitive question for, for, for all countries, especially, especially for US and even uh, for others. But uh, from Baltic states point, point uh, for us, long standing could be the, the, uh, well, more, more, more right word. Long standing, I like. I think we can work with that. Uh, Madam President, your own assessment of today. Well, first of all, I would uh, like to stress that. Uh, my microphone's not working. It's usually better be. So, this one has battery? No, it does. Well, um, for me, the most important thing is that we could um, come together and synchronize and harmonize our thinking of uh, the security risks. We probably have a few things to tell about our eastern neighbor, but we also learned about the picture your president and your administration has of the general world situation. This is important between the friends that we come together. Frank questions were asked. Uh, we tried to answer as we could. We also asked frank questions. And this way, we both know where we stand. We stand together. On the other hand, we always in Europe have to pay attention that we do more to make sure that uh, Europe is able to uh, protect itself. Tough questions were asked, and uh, I sense some impatience. And uh, I have to say that uh, it may be a deserved a level of impatience. So indeed, Europe needs to do more. We're always pushing as well for our partners and allies in Europe to do more, at the same time being extremely grateful for NATO's enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states and uh, Poland. Lots of investment has gone into uh, establishing EFP on the land, but now we need to make sure that these battalions are not left without the support they must feel that if something really went wrong, then the follow-on will be quick to come. And this is something which we discussed, and this is something we need to continue discussing with our uh, other allies uh, also in the, uh, in the uh, NATO summit uh, coming up uh, this summer. This is becoming really, really seriously important, as also we discussed uh, during our lunch meeting. You have a country which is in economic decline, which is falling behind technologically because it doesn't have access to our international technology development because of the sanctions, among other things. But it knows it is ahead conventionally, at least in regions close to NATO's territory. It is already using um, different opportunities and hybrid possibilities to chip away at the feeling of security of uh, people who live in NATO countries. We must stop it, and we must see through this game. And we must absolutely understand that we need, first of all, stand firm. Make sure we have a believable deterrence level. Take steps which we need to take for that all together. I think it would actually add value if we took these steps together at the NATO summit. Not, for example, like some were maybe hoping today we will walk away from here with a bunch of patriots. Would have been nice, but on the other hand, I think it's much better if we have a wider circle of, uh, of action in, uh, in this case. On the other hand, I learned quite a lot about how to keep going at the turbulent times, thinking forward in economic terms as well. Because what I really enjoyed about this summit, it had the business as usual part. Business, I mean, developing our economies together, doing together what we can do best in both countries. Estonia is a tech hub, and uh, we know we can contribute. We can contribute also in understanding to cyber security, which we are doing anyway, but there is more. There is cyber hygiene, there is a lot of um, safe use for internet sphere. We know that lots of people are right now losing faith that technology can be safe to use. We in Estonia have had a safe environment to use technology, to use internet for 17 years now. And we hope that finally now other people in other countries can benefit of this kind of secure technology use. And this is as important outcome of uh, this summit today as is our discussion on the uh, security and defense. We need to also go ahead with business as usual. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Madam President. 
Uh, let me build off your answer and, and turn to, um, uh, to the minister. And this is really a question for all three of you. Um, and it's the famous what keeps you awake at night question. Um, so you, you, you talked strongly about the issue of Russia and, and what's next there. So we've been surprised uh, by Georgia. We've been surprised by Crimea. We've been surprised by Syria. We are not surprised. Well, that's, that's, a, that, that's the answer. Why don't, you, why don't you jump in first here? So, so what, what, what should we not be surprised by next, uh, I, I guess, is the question. Because uh, are, uh, this, you, the Baltics don't exist in a vacuum. Is it really the Baltics that's uh, threatened? Is it the Balkans that's threatened? Is it our electoral systems that's threatened? Uh, how, or or, or how, how do you, we've just had the re-election of, uh, of Vladimir Putin. Uh, what, is, what do you see as potentially the next move that we should be looking out for? But Fred, you're so old-fashioned, bringing geography into it. I mean, yes, we are neighbors technically with Russia, but if you look at uh, where exactly we have seen this chipping away of security to come, it has been hybrid, it has been strategic communication. Now it was Salisbury. Mm -hmm. Did any of this happen physically, geographically close? And I think this is exactly what we need to be aware. This can happen wherever. What can happen, I think, again, it's quietly chipping away, trying to stay below the radar as if so nothing serious is going on. So Mr. President and Mr. Minister. I fully agree with uh, my colleague Kirsty, uh, but of course, uh, here we don't speak about uh, maybe re real military actions uh, because I think for Russia military actions must be quite enough at present moment but of course uh, they would like uh, to to impact the countries uh, neighboring neighboring countries first of all non EU countries uh, no, Non-NATO countries. In, in this, U, uh, U, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. The, what any, we call any the other, uh, Any other uh, neighboring countries from post-Soviet territory, mm -hmm. because anyway, uh, this Russian Russian thinking and also Putin thinking is that uh, they 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 lose territories through collapsing of uh, socialism through collapsing the Soviet Union, and of course they are still maybe thinking that uh, somehow to rejoin back some, some, uh, some, some territories. This is the reason why they establish stra strange, strange unions, you know, like a, a Euro-Asian Union, where uh, put together few countries who would like to work together, but in the same time, uh, Russia is always leading country in ev every issue. It means that uh, they, they show the force uh, every time, but uh, for others, not only for Baltic, Baltic states, but uh, for any other country, this, uh, as Kirsty mentioned, uh, Strategic communication uh, is very important. Uh, cyber issues are very important because, anyway, Russia will use such instruments against us. Try to split our societies uh, at least in two parts, uh, because in Latvia and in, in Estonia we have also Russian minority, and uh, Russia would like to impact. Uh, them by send, sending right, right signals from Russia point of, uh, uh, to, to Russians in our, in our country and try to change thinking and mind of uh, these persons. And I think it is the future challenge how we can take countermeasures against uh, this, what we will do for strengthening our societies, so what we can can do uh, to rise uh, to make stronger resilience against such such things, uh, not only in, in the Baltic states but also in other countries, especially in European countries, because in, in many European countries, 
uh, Russian minority is living even in U.S.? Yeah. So uh, one thing before I turn to Minister Linkovich is, is uh, as you know, uh, Mr. President, I believe you know, and I, I know General McMaster is aware of this as well, the Atlantic Council has a forward presence in your country with yeah. our digital forensic research lab, and we're doing 24-7 counter disinformation work because we see that it isn't just Patriot missiles that are needed. So uh, we understand that very well. M uh, Mr. Minister. First of all, uh, let me apologize on, the, on, the, on behalf of my president not being able to be here. But also, uh, on her behalf and uh, for all of us, let me say first of all, thank you to all our American friends, uh, Lithuanian friends, for deep-rooted, long-lasted, uh, value-based partnership through all these years. And when we are celebrating now centenary, half of the, that time was stolen because of occupations. But uh, non-recognition policy, especially by the United States, was a very big backup to all of us. So why we are here now, why we really can talk, discuss. So this is uh, before answering your question. Um, then um, what should be done in order to not be catched by surprise, as you said? Uh, so I would paraphrase that how many wake-up calls needed to wake up? It depends on personality. Also, how many times we can cross red lines? Again, it depends on the patients definition of these red lines and depends on the rules basically which was set by us us and basically for us it's really not surprised because lesson how many times lessons we, we will not be learned if we're talking about uh, war in south caucasus for instance 2008 you probably remember statements of all baltic states representatives uh, how we assess the situation what were the calls what russia must do what expected to do what we hope russia will do not a single not a single item was implemented and we got back to business as usual very quickly because there were voices for pragmatism flexibility whatever and they were lessons were not not learned by us were learned by russia so answer to your question would be let's be less naive let's be more more so to say pragmatic and uh, let's build our policies on the real events on the ground not listening to statements um, maybe some promises as well uh, really we can con contribute there if uh, we were not listened sufficiently 10 years ago let's be frank now we are really talking uh, and we feel that our expertise so to say observations proposals uh, assessments uh, are more interesting to our allies it's also lessons learned so what we can do as small countries we will not make big difference but by making right decisions uh, adding to the right coalitions we can really add value to our collective efforts, but by making wrong deci decisions, wrong things we re really can spoil. So our take from this summit was also uh, that we really can reconfirm strategic partnership with the United States. We're really looking at the future with the optimism. We really have much to do in fight with terrorism. We can much to do to make NATO more efficient and ef effective, I would say. Also, it's really, really something what we sh sharing uh, to, together, and we are coming uh, here not only to ask something, right? Because we are asking by stating our positions. We are asking by um, showing what we are going to do on the ground, uh, be it operations or be it policy or discussions on European Union and NATO relations, for instance. We are strong transatlantists. I don't know, Damon, maybe is not here, but we always, when we're discussing with Neymar, Damon, we're talking about how neat we people who are really uh, concerned about strong transatlantic ties. We are uh, playing this role in our European debates, and it's, it's also a contribution. So our take is very optimistic, and we really, uh, from now, looking ahead next century or, or, or maybe even longer, we really can do a lot of things and very good, uh, good sort of thoughts. So we're down the last eight, ten minutes, so I'd say two to three minutes from each of you on this question, and then we'll take a break for dinner and then hear General McMaster um, after uh, dinner. Um, so, um, let's get concrete. If you could, if you need right now two or three things from the United States that you do not have now uh, to face the situation that you're in, or for that matter from Europe, uh, we do represent the transatlantic community here at the Atlantic Council, uh, and there's a NATO summit coming up, what would, what would those be um, in whatever order you would like to take this? Two things. One is indeed technical, because if we think what we really lack, then it is uh, an, um, 
something which would be able to avoid an A2 AD situation. I mean, if something is keeping me awake during the night, this is exactly this. We need to solve this problem. Second is a little bit more holistic. A2. AD. Uh, A2 we A2 need to be able A2. to reach the Baltic states yeah. by airplanes in yeah. case yeah. there is the need to bring in yeah. additional uh, equipment yeah. people, etc. Mm. So A2 AD bubble is, uh, is something we need to prick. And then something more holistic. This is, if we look where things have gone wrong, it's always gone wrong at the moment and at the place where Russia has thought that our unit is cracking, even Salisbury, they would not have thought that the Europe will not react because there's Brexit. Of course, for us, it doesn't matter at all. We all reacted. And this was disappointment. But it's always this, if we need to predict where and what goes wrong, Let's see where we give the image that we are not sticking together. And so we must absolutely to stick together, not to allow any cracks to appear to be there, even if they are not. This is the most important now. Thank you so much for that answer. And uh, why don't we go to the minister first? And since you started, we'll let you uh, also end, Mr. President. In short, help us to protect ourselves. And the best A2AD's presence on our soil. We can choose the terminology. If you don't like permanent, it could be permanently rotational. It's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> we can be creative here. <laughs> but this is really the case. Also, I'd like to have leadership of US in shaping, shaping, so to say, NATO agenda to make it, as I said, more and more efficient. Decision-making forces more and more fast and uh, also uh, help us to fill capability gaps. And to single out uh, one of them, it uh, would be a defense, just for instance. But we cannot afford ourselves nationally, so we have to have this backup for the United States. So these are a few things I can, can mention. Of course, could be many more, but we can deliver ourselves as well. Okay. I, if, and and we'll, in, in your answer, Mr. President, please also touch on what you touched on before, which is for the gray zone states. So what do you need for yourselves? But what should this, this is the toughest question. What should the US and its allies be doing toward the states that are neither in NATO nor really part of, uh, of Russia, but seeking to be closer uh, to the West, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, 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 you know, um, and, uh, and obviously Georgia, and I could list one or two others. Uh, first, first of all, uh, maybe at what uh, we can do uh, together. F uh, first of all, I think uh, the NATO forces are presented on uh, our soil, but we need a real NATO presence in air and in in uh, Balt in, in Baltic Sea. It means uh, it will be quite interesting discussions. Uh, during the next NATO summit in Brussels uh, about uh, future NATO presence in our re region, how, how they will be presented uh, in our region. I think it's very, very important. Uh, second, secondly, I think we have to work more together uh, with countermeasures against, against uh, cyber, cyber attacks against uh, strategic communication uh, measures from, from, from Russia and so on. It means that we have to make our own, own measures, uh, better measures against uh, this, these things. Uh, about uh, this... Uh, other countries. First of all, I think uh, it is very important uh, to continue support them in their work uh, to implement uh, measures against corruption, against uh, different bureaucrat uh, bureaucratic obstacles and many other things. It means that we need to support uh, different reforms uh, in these countries. Because anyway, uh, if no reforms in these countries, the societies will be more weaker. More weaker, it means uh, Russia uh, could easier touch such part of so uh, society. It means that the influence on uh, this part will be higher uh, than uh, after, uh, after reforms. Uh, 
it means we need to support them all the time, uh, especially especially reforms. About military issues, okay, it's uh, military experts will discuss uh, which way, which support is better. Uh, but anyway, we also need, uh, we, we have to give quite uh, strong signals uh, to, for example, Ukraine, uh, Georgia about uh, future, future accession uh, in NATO, in join, join, joining NATO, because anyway, they are waiting for next step in our relations between uh, Georgia, for example, and NATO, or between Ukraine and NATO. It means that uh, we need some, uh, some concrete uh, step, what we will do uh, in, in the future. Uh, what I, I see both of you sort of reaching out for this gray zone question. One minute for each of you, and then we'll break for dinner. So, mi Mr. Minister and Madam President. Very briefly, very briefly just on, on Ukraine, countries like Ukraine. It's not about that country, it's about us, about our perception, ability to take decisions in time, not too late. And this is regardless what they not not regardless what they're doing, but regardless this big big progress what they're doing. So that would would be really important uh, checkpoint for all of us. Are we really ready to adequately assess the situation? Because time is not on our side. Uh, what's going on in Ukraine is really very difficult. And uh, to make more gray zones, that would, would not mean more security for us. So it's really important uh, to coordinate measures, to coordinate our, our steps in the future. A minute, minute is over, so I will stop here. But I yeah. would like to mention that it's not just their headache, it's our task as well. N NATO membership course for these countries, Madam President? Not expect, yeah. not exclude it, of yeah. course, yeah. when time comes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I would like to stress that there is also the European soft power, which can and is reaching out now again a bit more stronger towards the countries which are outside of the European Union. There is discussion of enlargement again, and I'm quite sure that out of the European Eastern Partners, it, it is Georgia, which has shown that it now really has internalized the process of becoming a really free democratic rule of law based country with really free media and pluralism, also on the political scheme. So first of all, there is room to reach out to Georgia in this way. Europe is doing quite a lot in Georgia, Ukraine, but I think Georgia deserves also now a clear message that it will one day be welcomed as part of the EU. Uh, where NATO is concerned, we always stand for keeping the doors open for enlargement of NATO. And it doesn't only need to concern, of course, these countries you are mentioning. There are other countries, I'm thinking of a couple up north, who might one day feel they want to be part of NATO. If they are not feeling this way, we are happy to cooperate with these countries also in the framework we are right now cooperating. But when, when you talk about open doors, I think you also should not forget North. So just to translate that, Finland and Sweden, the door is open to you. So just a couple of things in closing. First of all, um, uh, the, uh, uh, so you all know uh, Damon's been checked out medically. He's cleared to go home, which he's going to do, so all is fine with him, so very happy about that. Um, we didn't get to talk about what changed that made it possible to, for your countries to be where they are, and clearly there's been so much internal work you've done with your own societies and countries. But I do remember being at the Wall Street Journal Europe when we made an editorial decision to be in favor of NATO enlargement at a time when the US government was not yet there. And let's not forget that this was a pretty important turning point for your countries as well that helped open up EU membership as well. And can, can you imagine the situation we might be in right now with your three countries had all of that not happened? So let's take a dinner break now and we look forward uh, to hearing from General McMaster thereafter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I really have a, a distinct honor and a, a personal pleasure of uh, being able to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster of the United States Army. Um, as all of you know, General McMaster is the 26th National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. Uh, and as everyone knows, in the, the days ahead, he will step down from his White House post and retire from a celebrated 30 plus year career in the United States Army. I told um, General McMaster and Fred at the table that I was going to talk about the five or six best officers in the United States Army, and that would be General McMaster as a second lieutenant, General McMaster as a first lieutenant, <laughs> General McMaster as a captain, and so on. I won't do that, but what a career he's had, and aren't we all the better for it? HR, thank you. I, I'm not finished. <laughs> For decades, he's been identified as one of the Army's most capable commanders and one of its sharpest intellects. He is celebrated for his innovation and his courage, both on and off the field of battle. And he's earned his stripes in the Battle of Washington, I can tell you that. He served with great distinction and valor in Desert Storm, uh, where he was awarded a Silver Star for heroism, and her Operation Iraqi Freedom, and has contributed to Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and he's celebrated for his leadership and valor in both the First and Second Gulf Wars. In addition to his reputation on the field of battle and his innovative tactics as a soldier, H.R. McMaster is recognized as one of the United States military foremost intellectual thinkers. His scholarship helped to prepare the United States Army for threats of the future and shed new light on counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, and military leadership theory. In February of 2017, John McMaster was appointed as National Security Advisor by the President. And during his tenure, he has brought coherence and structure to the National Security Council in support of the administration's reassessment of critical national security issues. Under his leadership and in support of the President's objectives, the National Security Council has produced a highly regarded and globally read national security strategy. More importantly, for the purposes of our dinner this evening, John McMaster has played an important role in supporting President Trump's reinforcement of NATO's eastern flank. During his tenure as National Security Advisor, President Trump has attended the Three Seas Summit in Warsaw and pledged support for U.S. energy exports to Europe, committed greater funds to the European Defense Initiative, Deterrence Initiative, excuse me, brought new military capabilities to exercises and rotations in Europe, and secured greater defense spending commitments from our allies. For these accomplishments and as many other achievements in uniform, our country and our allies around the world owe General McMaster a debt of gratitude for his lifetime of service to our country and to its security. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a great American leader, a great American diplomat, and a great American soldier, General H.R. McMaster. Thank you so much. Thank you, General Jones, and it's really, it's really me who owes all of you a debt of gratitude. Uh, General Jones, in, in particular, uh, he was so gracious to me when I took over this position. And, and on that line about you know, the best officers in the Army, there are a lot of people who know better than that, especially General Lute. 
uh, for, <laughs> for whom I served as his plans officer when I was a captain uh, in the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. And then Rich, and Rich Clark, who's here, our great uh, J5 uh, on the Joint Staff, who's my West Point classmate. And, and who knows, as a kid, I was often misunderstood and a victim of circumstance at, at West Point. But, uh, but, uh, but th thank, thank you, thank you, uh, General Jones. Thank you for your work with, with Fred Kemp and, and, and Damon Wilson. I'm so glad he's, he's okay to organize this wonderful event and host all of us for dinner. The Atlantic Council is a special place and the Atlantic Council does special work that is, that is increasingly important to all of our, all of our security. But President Kalulad uh, and, and President uh, Vionis, what an honor to be here uh, with, with two great leaders uh, who have been so strong, so strong for their own nations, but really so strong for the West and, and all of us. And, and, um, and Minister uh, Link, uh, uh, Linkovicius, uh, it is great, it's great to, to be here with you and, and, and all of your delegations. Um, and what, what, a great, what a great idea uh, to, to, um, to, to, be, to pull together this group here, thank you, Atlantic Council, on this historic occasion of the U.S. Baltic Centennial Summit. So I want to just begin by congratulating Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania once again on their 100th anniversary of independence. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to celebrate this important milestone with you, with you uh, in Washington, D.C. And so what, what we'll think, though, more, uh, even more so uh, than the history, about the history, is that we're beginning 100 years of renewed partnership among, among our nations. As President Trump said earlier today, the United States has never ceased to recognize the independence of the Baltic republics. In 1940, when the Soviet Union invaded your nations, U.S. Acting Secretary of State Sumner Wells issued the famous Wells Declaration. In that declaration, Wells confidently wrote that the American people opposed any form of intervention on the part of one state, however powerful, in the domestic concerns of any other sovereign state, however weak. In the absence of respect for sovereignty, Wells continued, the basis of modern civilization itself cannot be preserved. After Wells' bold and historic declaration, through the decades of Soviet occupation that followed, the United States continued to affirm the sovereignty of the Baltic republics. Throughout that entire period, we confidently displayed the flags of independent Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania alongside our own. Tonight, we celebrate this proud history at a critical no moment for our nations and the world. Critical because we are now engaged in a fundamental contest between our free and open societies and closed and repressive systems. Revisionist and repressive powers are attempting to undermine our values, our institutions, and our way of life. To preserve our sovereignty and prevail, we must renew the same confidence that inspired Wells and empowered the people of the Baltic nations through decades of Soviet occupation. Armed with this confidence, we will triumph over new threats, including those posed by Russia's increased aggression around the world. Since the denial of service attacks on Estonia in 2007 and the invasion of Georgia in 2008, Russia has used old and new forms of aggression to undermine our open societies and the foundations of international peace and stability. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have all been targeted by Russia's so-called hybrid warfare, a pernicious form of aggression that combines political, economic, informational, and cyber assaults against sovereign nations. Russia employs sophisticated strategies, deliberately designed to achieve objectives while falling below the target state's threshold for a military response. 
tactics include infiltrating social media, spreading propaganda, weaponizing information, and using other forms of subversion and espionage. So for too long, some nations have looked the other way in the face of these threats. Russia brazenly and implausibly denies its actions, and we have failed to impose sufficient costs. The Kremlin's confidence has grown as its agents conduct their sustained campaigns to undermine our confidence in ourselves and in one another. Last month, Russia used a military-grade nerve agent in an attempted murder that endangered the lives of over 130 people, including many children. This attack was the first offensive use of nerve agent in Europe since the Second World War. It was an assault on the United Kingdom's sovereignty. And any use of chemical weapons by a state party is a clear violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Russia has also conducted numerous cyber attacks against free nations. On March 15th, the Trump administration released a report condemning the Russian government for malicious cyber intrusions that targeted U.S. critical infrastructure, including our energy sector. And we also know that Russia was behind the recent NotPetya cyber attack that caused billions of dollars in damage around the world. Further, over the past year, Russia has conducted numerous intercepts of U.S., allied, and partner aircraft and vessels, including in the Nordic Baltic region, threatening freedom of navigation and endangering our personnel. Mr. Putin may believe that he is winning in this new form of warfare. He may believe that his aggressive actions in the parks of Salisbury, in cyberspace, in the air, and on the high seas can undermine our confidence, our institutions, and our values. Perhaps he believes that our free nations are weak and will not respond, will not respond to his provocations. He is wrong. Russian aggression is strengthening our resolve and our confidence. We might all help Mr. Putin understand his grave error. We might show him the beaches of Normandy, where lingering craters and bullet holes demonstrate the West's will to sacrifice to preserve our freedom. We might bring him to our concert halls and theaters where the music and art of our people reveal our freedom to create, imagine, and to dream. We might take him to our universities where the free exchange of ideas among young men and women displays our freedom to learn, to speak, and to achieve our highest aims. We might lead him to the stately buildings here in Washington, where inscriptions carved deep into stone proclaim that we are free to worship, equal under the law, and opposed to every form of tyranny over the mind of man. We might introduce him to the people, the people of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, who endured the devastation of the Second World War decades of Soviet occupation and communism, and emerged proud, strong, sovereign, free, and prosperous. These are three of the most creative and innovative nations on earth. And Mr. Putin might also then consider how the Russian people's aspirations connect his own population to us, despite the Kremlin's efforts to sow dissension abroad and repress freedom at home. In the room tonight are elected officials, public servants, intellectuals, and leaders from the private sector. We converse without fearing that our opinions will lead to imprisonment, torture, or the death of a loved one. We might ask others around the world a simple question. Would you rather be part of, of a small club of autocrats you know, that might rotate their meetings between Moscow, Tehran, Damascus, Havana, Caracas, and Pyongyang? Or would you rather be a club of free peoples who respect sovereignty, individual rights, and the rule of law? I think our club is better. And I think our club's more fun, for sure, <laughs> than that club.
It is, it, is t- it is time that we expose those who glamorize and apologize in the service of communist, authoritarian, and repressive governments. Regimes who torture, enslave, oppress, and murder their people. Even in the United States and in other free nations, some journalists, academics, public officials, and saddest of all, young people have developed and promulgated idealized, warped views of tyrannical regimes. A clear-eyed view of the brutal nature of repressive governments and ideologies is central to the president's national security strategy. And I, I appreciate the the uh, I appreciate the the comments about the national security strategy, but I should just say that it was really Dr. Nadia Shadlow who ran that effort and did a wonderful job for the president um, and and and, uh, and and led a great team to do that. So, great job. Since taking office, the president has repeatedly told the truth about these murderous regimes and oppressive doctrines. I'd like to ask you to to refer to some of the previous speeches. I mean, we heard this truth from the president at the United Nations. We heard this truth in Riyadh. We heard this truth in Warsaw. We heard this truth in Seoul. And we heard this truth in the seat of our democracy as Mr. Xi Sung-ho raised his crutches above the chamber in defiance. The history of repression and authoritarianism is one of theft, (coughs) torture, murder, and immense human suffering. And it is not, sadly, it is not a phenomenon of the past. We are presently engaged in competitions with repressive and authoritarian systems to defend our way of life, to preserve our free and open societies. We must be confident. We must be active. We cannot be passive and hope that others will defend our freedom. The call to compete, to cooperate with others who share our principles, and to catalyze positive change is central to the president's national security strategy. And over the past year, the United States, our allies, and our partners have acted to defend our institutions and our liberty. Last week, in response to Russia's nerve agent attack, nations around the world, including the United States and the Baltic Republics, announced the coordinated expulsion of Russian officials from their countries. The United States played a supporting role in catalyzing a response by NATO and like-minded nations. The number of expelled officials is growing. As of last Friday, nearly 30 countries had acted to expel more than 150 Russian officials. These actions represent the largest collective expulsion of Russian intelligence officers in history. In the United States, President Trump ordered the removal of dozens of Russian intelligence officers and the closure of the Russian consulate in Seattle. This action will also help protect our democratic institutions and processes as these Russian officers orchestrate Russia's sustained campaign of propaganda, disinformation, and political subversion. In April of last year, the United States joined eight other nations in establishing the new European Center of Excellence for countering hybrid threats to defend against new forms of aggression and subversion. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, nations that experienced the first blows from Russia in cyberspace and on social media, all are lending their invaluable expertise to that center. The Trump administration also continues to impose sanctions and other penalties on Russian entities for targeting our cybersecurity, attacking our infrastructure, and otherwise infringing on the sovereign rights of the United States and our allies. And the United States, as has already been mentioned, is, sub- is substantially increasing funding for the European Deterrence Initiative, or EDI, which provides billions of dollars to U.S. military and allied forces in Europe to deter Russian aggression and prevent conflict. So we are acting, but we must recognize the need for all of us to do more to respond to and deter Russian aggression, especially in four critical areas. First, 
we must compete across all arenas to counter so-called hybrid warfare, this new form of Soviet-era active measures and maskarovka. We must reform and integrate our military, political, economic, law enforcement, and informational instruments of power to deter and defeat threats to our sovereignty. Second, we must catalyze change. We must invest in our cyber infrastructure to ensure that we protect our data, our innovation base, and infrastructure against espionage and theft and attack. To deter adversaries, we must be prepared to impose a high cost in response to cyber aggression. Third, we must all cooperate to share responsibility in these and other security efforts. Even as the United States has committed nearly $10 billion to EDI, many NATO countries, unlike the Baltic nations we are, uh, the, the, who are here tonight, are still not honoring the Wales pledge to spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense. Our mutual security requires everyone to contribute. Finally, we must realize that all of our actions depend on preserving our strategic confidence, our will to advance our values and defend our way of life. In that 1940 declaration that affirmed the Baltic nation's independence, Sumner Wells was, was clear. The people of the United States are opposed to predatory activities, no matter whether they are carried on by the use of force or by the threat of force. Wells's noble text forever bound Americans to our Baltic brothers and sisters in a partnership based on respect for sovereignty, freedom, and the rule of law. As President Kalyulide said earlier today, as long as we remain confident in these foundational principles, proud of our history, and faithful to our values, our nations will remain strong, secure, and free. It has been a privilege, great privilege to serve uh, the United States for 34 years. Uh, tonight at my last public engagement, it is an honor to address an audience that fundamentally understands what is at stake for our free and open societies. Early in my career, I had a chance with General Liu to, to, to patrol the east-west German border and to see, to see that artificial boundary collapse, collapse suddenly one day, and to go from staring down East German border guards across the border to our soldiers being flocked with East Germans carrying bouquets of flowers and, and bottles of wine. And so, so we ought to be confident. We ought to be confident that freedom will triumph over repression. But we must strengthen our resolve, cooperate to share responsibility, catalyze positive change, and compete effectively in new arenas. The victory uh, of free societies is not predestined. And, and, uh, and I think that point was made earlier uh, as well. There's nothing inevitable about the course of, of, of human events in history. And there is no arc of history, there is no so-called end of history that will ensure our, our success. Brave men and women have fought for our liberty. They fought with their pens, as Sumner Wells did in 1940. They fought with their swords, as, as your brave independence fighters did in 1918 from these Baltic republics. And today, the survival of our free and open societies and our way of life continues to depend on our confidence in our values, on our pride in our heritage, and on our will to defend our freedom. Thank you for the, the great privilege of being, of being with you this evening. It's truly been an honor. Thank you so much. General McMaster, um, uh, what an amazing speech uh, in your last public engagement as National Security Advisor of the United States. Thank you for that ringing voice of clarity. This will go down in the Atlantic Council's storied 60-year history as one of the great statements, one of the most crucial moments 
in our country's uh, uh, decision-making process for the future. Let me just quote one statement, but we'll have all of this um, as soon as we can on our website. We are, we are presently engaged in a competition with regimes of authority and systems to defend our way of life. Uh, uh, and the rest of it, in the historic context and the rest of it, uh, as, as you can see by this standing ovation, uh, we applaud not only you and your service, but the statement you delivered tonight in honor of this 100th anniversary. And let's not forget, it's the 100th anniversary of an independence that at first failed and again has come to rise. And so I think that has to inspire us doubly uh, to recommit ourselves to this cause. Thank you for inspiring us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And, th and thank you all for attending.